been discovered, but it is a much wider array than we're going to see uh, today in my lecture. Um, much older than Neanderthal, and there's many, many, many more specimens of Neanderthal now. We know a lot more about its culture from uh, cave findings and things like that. Uh, you may have heard of Lucy, known as Ast Australopithecus afarensis. Lucy was dug up a few decades ago in Ethiopia. Um, at the time, the earliest upright, in other words, bipedal hominid, roughly a little bit more than three million years old. Her skeleton is shown here on the right. But this record of, of fossil hominids now extends back roughly six million years. Lucy, the inference that Lucy was bipedal comes from detailed examination of some of her anatomy. But there's other evidence about the existence of bipedal hominids at this time span of more than three million years ago. And I want to show you this example because I, it personally, I think it's one of the most spectacular fossil finds ever. At a dig site called Litoli in Tanzania about 25 years ago, a team discovered these footprints, which are those of an upright walking hominid adult and juvenile alongside each other through what was a fresh ash bed. You may know that East Africa is volcanically a very active region, um, the so-called Rift Valley. Well, when there were volcanic eruptions, when that ash falls, maybe a little rain falls with it, that has the consistency of wet cement. Well, these two hominids were walking along, and their footprints were made to be uncovered by another hominid more than three million years later. Um, so this is about an 80-foot long trail, um, and I think you can see the foot impressions rather clearly. So uh, in addition to footprints of uh, ancient hominids, we do have a lot of fossil evidence of our own species, Homo sapiens. And just to give you a little bit more of a time context, the oldest specimens we have of Homo sapiens date to about 160,000 years ago. So our species is, depending upon your relative time scale, relatively young, perhaps younger than 200,000 years old. And um, there's a fairly good fossil record of our history. And we know from that fossil record, for example, that Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthals, coexisted at various times and in some places on Earth. But we're down to one hominid now. It's us. So we're going to have to make do. The tree of the evolutionary tree of hominids has been worked on quite a great deal. I want to give you some notion of what that tree looks like without burying you in some of the details. But if you just look at this shaded region on the left and the red bars, the red bars represent inferred, proposed individual hominid species on our line. And the length of the red bar represents the time frame that paleontologists think that these individual species spanned. So we have a rather bushy evolutionary tree. All lines but one have died out. We are closely related to the chimp. And the chimp's close relative is the bonobo, another type of chimpanzee. And then a little more distantly related to the gorilla and the orangutan. So if you trace these branches down the evolutionary tree, you see that we shared a, our most recent common ancestor with chimpanzees roughly six to seven million years ago. Now, just so you understand the nature of the fossil record, there's been tremendous effort to uncover fossil hominids. And hominids moved out into areas that left a better fossil record than the sorts of rainforests that things like gorillas and chimpanzees live in. So we could be fairly confident that if you knew what the chimpanzee evolutionary tree looked like, it would be a bushy tree as well. But there's only one fossil species of chimpanzee known, because where they lived and where they die is not a very good place for, for fossil preservation. So I don't want you to give some, have some idea that there's a ton of hominid species, but just for some reason, these four apes have existed unchanged. When you look at a gorilla, or you look at a chimp, or you look at an orangutan, you're looking at also a product, a twig on that tree of life. There were lots and lots and lots of other species on that lineage that are no longer around today. Remember, extinction predominates the pattern of evolutionary history. And of all those red bars, it's this one that's us. I just want you to get a sense of the time scale that the history of our species is only about 3% of the total history since that split from our common ancestor with chimpanzees 6 million years ago. And the implications of that are that a whole lot has happened before the origin of our species. A whole lot of evolution was taking place before the dawn of our species. 
97% of the time was elapsing, but a whole lot of changes in body form, upright walking, long preceded Homo sapiens, etc. So the challenge to understand human origins better is to understand from the fossil record the order in which various characters appeared or disappeared, and to understand a little bit of the lifestyles of those species if possible, and then to sort of figure out what was going on, what makes us different from any other hominids, um, if anything, uh, in the course of time. So what was going on? Well, there were some obvious things going on. One of the most obvious things going on was skull evolution. So I'm showing you here representative skull, sketches of representative skulls from a chimpanzee on the upper left and from some ancient hominids and uh, modern Homo sapiens here in the lower right. And lots of changes were happening in the skull. If you pay attention in particular to the overall size of the skull, to the size of the skull apportioned to the brain case, to the jaw, etc. So Australopithecus africanus is a relative of this guy here. This is a cast of Australopithecus boisei. You can see, for example, that you might even say he has a little bit more ape-like appearance, broader face, shallower nose, bigger jaw, and this sagittal crest on the top of his head. This is Homo erectus, shown there on the lower right. Again, a younger species, but still a good hop, skip, and a jump away from Homo sapiens. A Neanderthal, Cro-Magnon. So there's been lots of changes in skull morphology, but those, of course, reflect some interesting changes going on inside that soup bowl, and that's with brain evolution. So whether it's just our own point of view or whether it's something that if, if there was another type of naturalist on the planet that wasn't human, whether they'd agree that this is the most dominant feature of human evolution, clearly brain size has been changing and been changing in some dramatic ways. But I'm showing you in this bar graph, if you look back to the brain sizes of hominids on our line of the tree, you can see that they have been ascending in size over evolutionary time, but we are talking about millions of years. You can see roughly from a little more than two million years ago to a million years ago, almost the two-fold step up. That was probably one of the more dramatic phases of change in, in brain size. It also happens to be a time when the Earth's climate was changing uh, quite a great deal. And there's a lot of theories that one of the driving forces, one of the selective forces here for the increase in brain size was hominids, unlike their ape cousins, being out on the savanna and coping with the dramatic climate changes, the droughts, the heavy rains, the migrations of animals, um, remembering where fruit was, remembering where foodstuffs were, more complex social behaviors, and you needed a, a bigger brain to handle all those sorts of activities. So coping with a more dynamic climate probably played an important role in expansion of the capacity of our brains. But just before you get a little too full of yourself, I will point out that Neanderthals had bigger brains than we do, and they're not around anymore. There are lots of other traits changing, and just as for the sticklebacks, if you remember David's list of all sorts of behavioral, morphological, and physiological traits that were changing, we know all sorts of things that distinguish us from other apes. Uh, highlighting a few here, brain topology, all the, the uh, um, folding of our, of our large brain. We do have brains with a, with a fairly different anatomy. Um, language, the evolution of speech and language, of course, a really important step in our biological and our cultural evolution. Reduced hair cover, a, rel a large relative brain size, as I already mentioned. Our skull is balanced upright on our vertebral column. Walking or upright walking is a pretty clever invention. And one thing it did, of course, is it freed these things up to do other things. Um, lots of other characters that have changed. So we can't just be thinking about brain size alone. In fact, if you're going to have brain size changing, some interesting things have to happen with our uh, changes in lifestyle or changes in life history, namely the length of time that we develop in the womb is going to change, uh, pelvic size in females is going to change, delivering big brain babies is quite a challenge, so we're born relatively immature and require a long period of maternal care um, for our development. So lots of other things are going on that are changing. Our diet is changing from more of pretty much a herbivore to more of an omnivore in, in later species.